Hello, it's the 8th of August, 2018, and this is API Conversation number 12, Jack Brewer. This is your host, Paul Carr, and in this episode of API Conversations, our guest will be Jack Brewer, author of The Grays Have Been Framed, Exploitation in the UFO Community, and also blogger at the UFO Trail. Given all that's been going on lately, I think Jack lends a sober, calm, rational voice to what is often a very shrill debate about all the evidence that's been presented starting late last year. I spoke to Jack this evening, the 8th of August, 2018. What follows is almost entirely unedited, except for a bit at the beginning. So... Jack Brewer. I'm here with Jack Brewer. Hello, Jack. Hi, Paul. Good to talk to you. Now, Jack, I think a lot of people know who you are. You're the author of The Grays Have Been Framed, which is a book about, uh, among other things, uh, the alien abduction racket, but also about uh, the CIA and and torture and so on. Uh, really good book. I recommend it. Uh, but uh, tell us a bit more about yourself. Give us a bit of a broader background than just the author of one book. Sure. Well, thanks for the recommendation on the book. I appreciate that. I uh, did work in grant writing and um, public nonprofit corporations. I've done some consulting and, and nonprofit management. And I have long been interested in the UFO phenomenon. And um, as a child, was interested in it and uh, was interested in sci fi and that kind of thing. And in the uh, early 90s I started attending the conferences and was just fascinated with it but came in much more of a believer for lack of a better term than I would call myself at this point I think many of us as we come into the community aren't um, really aware of how much crazy or unreliable talk and claims go on and the more I got involved in it and the more I looked at it the less credible a lot of it was and that's not to say that there's not some things interesting happening but it's definitely concerning how much exploitation of the topic there is right well my my own experience of that has been that the loud people lean non credible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the quiet people lean credible. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, oftentimes. But yes. the, the loud people are what you'll come across when uh wherever you wherever you turn. So uh that's one of the reasons I got into field investigation. I wanted to talk to the quiet people. Right. And and find out for yourself what is taking place, what people are saying, rather than what you're being told is happening. Sure. Yeah. And, and it turns out the quiet people do have a story to tell. They're just not they're not shutting it from the rooftops like some others. Yeah. And a lot of people with stories to tell in their defense don't claim to know what it was. They oh, they oh, yeah. just I think actually, say, it's actually very common. Yeah. Right. Right. And and then it was my experience when they start getting indoctrinated for back of, lack of a better term, a number of things might happen to people at that point if they start going to some of the conferences or regional meetings or reading a lot of the material that's that goes around the community. A tug of war might happen between different factions of the community with a newcomer to want to mold their story to fit the agenda of the people doing the tug of war. 
And a few different things, in my opinion, my observations might happen at that point, ranging from the person gets disgusted and wants nothing to do with any of it, to fully embraces one of those ideologies to the point that it might even change their perceptions of past memories and what they thought had been happening to them and just come up with a whole new identity of what these experiences might mean. And then some people even go on past that to kind of level out and come back and go, I don't know, let's take another look at it. And it, it's it's tough in that way when there's so many different strong passionate beliefs that often don't have a thread of objectivity and and calm rationality running through them yeah i i and you know i think that uh for investigators there's a very strong ethical issue here which is if you start pushing an interpretation at somebody about their memories you're going to start molding their memories. Absolutely. And I, I just think that's the wrong thing to do to somebody. So uh, it doesn't, you know, if I can explain that somebody saw the planet Venus or whatever, and I'm confident that that was the answer, I'll tell them that. But uh, if I don't know what it was, I'll just say, I don't know what it was you saw. I don't know what it was mm -hmm. you experienced. Uh, and, and that's kind of up to you to, to, uh, I'll give you the facts that I that I can un as best as I can understand them, but you're going to have to create your own narrative, and mm -hmm. because I really worry about that, I really I don't want someone to to you know to build their world around something I told them, <laughs> which is I very wrong. much agree and I empathize with. It is a matter of ethics uh, to. Um, at a humanitarian level, it, it's a matter of ethics and something that deserves mention as well, I think, in, in a conversation like this is ethics exist in research projects for good reasons. And one of them is to help keep the data clean and objective. Yeah. And so not only are we potentially harming people by pushing agendas on them, but you don't get good quality information. I mean, there's really no point in even conducting the research if you know where you're going to end up, you That's know? Right. Yeah, well, I mean, you, in, in your book, <laughs> uh, you documented some of the unethical experiments that were done in uh, not that long ago, within living memory. Uh, right. And, and there's still, I mean, uh, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is uh, that you've brought up is the American Psychological Association's complicity in uh, some of the interrogation me methods. Yes, it, it is concerning what we know has gone on at Guantanamo Bay. What is implied might be going on is, is concerning. We know that there have been interrogations that the APA and its, its doctors have been involved in, and there's even a movement going on now where uh, a lot of the medical professionals are trying to resist that the APA is conducting hearings, in fact, that they might consider going back to some of these torture sites now under the guise of offering uh, mental health treatment to people being tortured. And it just doesn't ring clear. It doesn't ring true. It, it's quite disturbing and concerning and we can even kind of segue this into the ufo topic and the aatip atip project that everyone's been talking about and that some of the statements coming out of the ttsa camp the tom delong group and and their associates is that 
the physical effects of seeing UFOs were studied on certain people. And that's just a heck of a statement to throw out without really following it up with what that means. Yeah, I, I like, found that perplexing. It's, it's like... Were yeah. these people, like what people? And yeah. were they told what they were being, like what are the parameters of such a study? Yeah, I mean, and that what, would, that would never what get board through, oversaw yeah. it, you that, know? That Go would, ahead. That would never get through a, an ethics board, <laughs> at, you know, at any any major research institution uh, i'd sure like to see the proposal and the the process on it indeed yeah yeah i thought that was very odd that it just got thrown out uh now that was ostensibly a leak but i really don't think it was a leak in the classic sense uh right i think that george knapp already you know he, he he's getting uh a release of of documents that he wants uh I just don't understand that. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't understand about ATIP. I, I think we we'll, we should probably go over that. Uh, uh, that was what what you just mentioned was one of the more bizarre things that came out. Uh, and apparently, a lot of this work done under DOD funding was done at Skinwalker Ranch, which I, you know, causes me to. Uh, that was one of those big what moments <laughs> how could that happen uh, right i mean uh but uh and we still don't know how much money was spent at, on skinwalker versus other other uh work that was done but uh no we don't and and i can empathize with there's the the one group in our community that is just excited and thrilled as can be that there's people with credentials talking about this and it's making the mainstream news and I can empathize with that. Yet I really go here with the direction you're talking, Paul, that this really needs to be put in a cohesive form of like, exactly what happened under what parameters and show us the project data and the proposals and the chain of custody and the objectives and the methods and you know if people if scientists if career intelligence officers are going to put forth claims as fact they should expect to be asked to present the the authenticated data on it yeah and, and of course you can always throw up oh that's classified uh or you know the dod doesn't want us to release us release that yet and then what can we say right right i i guess what i kind of say to that is well then why are you talking about it you know uh -huh. like it, it, like it, it that's one of the things that really frustrate me that I've seen them in some of the Q and A say, well, I can't talk about that. And like, well, you brought it up, you know? And so it, especially when we have such a well-documented history of games being played in this community, it seems like, knowledgeable educated people should understand it's even more important to do it carefully and do it right when you should expect to be subject to a great deal of scrutiny right i mean it, your most recent blog post was went back over the old benowitz story mm -hmm. and uh uh and richard doty and of course, that that's from the uh, the eighties, but uh, yeah, I mean, the we have documented cases of people being messed with, gaslighted, with almost true but not quite true information, uh, and that's I just I, I my concern is that it's gotten way more sophisticated now, and. 
It's not just Richard Doty. No, it, it's not. And, you know, George Hansen and some others, you know, a lot of folks have done a good job of documenting the, uh, the involvement of intelligence personnel in the UFO community is stunning in itself. How, how many names we could mention through the 90s into this century that have had an impact on the community that are interested in it. It won the old Open Minds Forum several years ago. All one had to do was go there to see that um, intelligence personnel were talking on a regular basis with some of the posters there. And who, why is anybody's guess? And while I don't want to fan unwarranted conspiracy theories, it's not conspiracy mongering to say it's reasonable to ask what this is about, especially when you're putting forth claims and you're, you're claiming that you know about this crash or these bodies or this, that, and the other, and well, are you working or, you know, what's the deal here? And it, it, it's certainly reasonable now in present tense when intelligence officers get involved with an entertainment company to expect evidence available for public review, evidence that's in proportion to the claim and it's really frustrating that we're continuing to wait on the paperwork and the documents. And in some cases, Senator Reid chastised the, the media for claiming it's all publicly available. And then in another case, will say that he's tried to make it available. And while some of this might be semantics, the bottom line is we don't have any documents or paperwork on any of this. And the people that are excited about it, they might be right. They might be shown to eventually have a lot of information that they're glad they got. Yet it's still, in the meantime, the best we can reasonably do is just suspend judgment because we haven't been given anything that, verifies what all the talk is about yeah i i and it, i i kind of wonder why that is and also i wonder why the foia requests so far have pretty much come up empty on that that's correct i was thinking about that when you just mentioned skinwalker i did a did a request on if defense intelligence agency dia had any files on operations with uh, NIDS, you know, that was Skinwalker during that time frame, since it was heavily implied that, that ATIP had been working there. That came back negative. Um, the best I think anybody's gotten so far is that the DIA is, needs more time to compose the files on uh, a tip, but as of yet, no, there hasn't been any actual release verifying what the objectives were or the methods or what was obtained. And it, it's, you know, it, it's the same old, same old of what to believe when we have reporters telling us it's a massive project that's blowing the lid off the cover up. And then in the same story, we have some Pentagon official quoted as saying it was only 22 million, which is relatively not much money in a national budget. And it didn't produce enough results to warrant further funding. So which do you believe, you know? Right. Well, uh, that, yeah. And the other thing is that, uh, now we, the, probably the biggest extravaganza so far, the biggest public release has been the Tic Tac video. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and, and uh, it certainly looks real. And uh, David Fravor, one of the pilots who was in, who did, actually did not take the video, but who commanded that fighter wing, uh, according to, well, I, I'm not sure it's been verified, but uh, let's take him at his word on that. Uh, his, uh, he seems like a credible guy, knows what he's talking about. Uh, and yet, uh, the FOIA requests have come up empty on getting DIA or the Navy to say, yeah, that's our video. That they have. And I, I think that it's an interesting enough case. I don't have any reason to think anyone is, is outright misrepresenting the truth. Yet we know that in the discovery process, we, we await verification. And one of the, the things that's concerning about that is DeLong's camp claimed they had proof of chains of custody of these videos and have not produced any such proof or chains of custody. Now, is that really a big deal to some people? It's not, but it just doesn't bode well that he claimed to have something that hasn't been produced. And why won't the DOD verify that they released that video? Those are reasonable questions. I agree. And, and uh, it's, yeah, the thing is the video might be, even the video was 99% accurate. If there's 1% falsehood in there, it, it destroys the whole case. Uh, we, we had this, I remember, remember, I remember uh, a number of years ago, I think it was 2007, the Chicago O'Hare case. Mm -hmm. And we were all asking, why aren't there any cell phone photographs? Because even in 2007, people had cameras right. on their cell phones. Why aren't there any photographs? And a photograph did come up. And it looked pretty credible. It looked like it was a real photograph. It wasn't great, but it was, you know, cell phone photographs from 2007 weren't that good. But uh, some people, uh, sympathetic to the case, by the way, uh, show that there was some, a little bit of jiggery-pokery in the, in the photo. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Not much, but just enough to discredit it. And mm -hmm. and if you can, that's all you need. It's just one item that looks like it's wrong, and the whole thing gets blown out of the water. And you know, you, you can you can you can easily can, then at that point you can accept. Oh, okay, well the whole thing must be a scam, and then uh, you've taken what what's possibly a great case and have made it into a hoax. It, it's concerning. Along those same lines, I've wondered how much footage did To the Stars actually get? And did they edit down to a couple of minutes? Or is that all they were given? And either circumstance the obvious question would be well why not release everything you got why not 10 minutes eight minutes whatever it is why not let us hear everything they were talking about before they encountered the the object and instead of just giving us this couple of minutes of or in some cases seconds of statements and remarks Right. And in fact, I, I have questions about how the audio got synced to the video initially. Uh, somebody probably had to manually do that. Uh, sure. One would think. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I have to say, I, I think it's the potential is there for a really great case. Maybe even the best case ever. And, which, and therefore, that, that's why I'm worried. See? Because right. you could have a fantastic case uh, that could be, if it's contaminated by one single phony edit, 
then we have to throw the whole thing out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I really hope that that uh, to the stars people are correct about this. I really hope that they're right. I just, I just don't. Uh, I agree with you. I don't. I don't know why information that would support that is being held is being held back. Yeah, it, it's especially like I was saying in a community that has the history this one does. One should expect to go above and beyond even normal protocol and normal amounts of transparency when there's such a history of, uh, you know, shenanigans mm -hmm. that it, it's, it's concerning. What are they doing? Why are they doing it? Uh, letter just got posted the other day it was going around twitter that was allegedly um elizondo's resignation and it had no provenance and chain of custody and uh, had spelling errors in it and you know it, it's it's just a mess when stuff like that is happening All right and well the first thing, well, the first test I apply is, uh, could this be something a science fiction writer come up with? Right? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a particularly good science fiction writer, <laughs> uh, and, and we wouldn't be able to tell the difference. If, if that's the case, then 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 I assign it a low credibility. Uh, if if there's a document that comes from a real archive that's released. Uh, with a chain of custody, and I say, yeah, now that that's re that that's potentially real. The credibility shoots way up. Uh, mm -hmm. it never goes to hundred percent, but it <laughs> it uh it goes up. So um, now th these documents uh, that uh, were ostensibly leaked. This list of documents and authors. The 38 papers. Yeah. yeah. 37, one of which was redacted. So right. There's 37 we know about. Uh, I th and I think you went over that. I know Keith Basterfield went over that. I went over that in some depth. Uh, the problem is with that is, uh, yeah, some a lot of those authors are le legitimate uh, scientists. But the stuff they were writing about, uh, we, which we don't have... We don't have uh, very many of the reports it's per se, but I, I could kind of guess what they're writing about based upon their published work in the same right. area. Uh, a lot of it is, there's a, extensive open literature already on that. It's not like they were revealing deep technological secrets or anything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, while we haven't seen the reports, I suspect that they are very much of the sort of executive summary type of thing. Uh, right. For example, one guy wrote about laser weapons. Uh, I looked him up. He's a legitimate laser weapon. He's retired now, but he's legitimate laser weapons uh, expert. Uh, he had written in the open literature, I'm sure possibly in the closed literature as well, about laser weapons uh, extensively. He went to a lot of conferences and presented a lot of uh, PowerPoint charts about what laser weapons could do and so on and now laser weapons and, and back then 2008 laser weapons were still kind of edgy now they're almost mainstream they're about to be deployed mm -hmm. uh, and that's just one example other things are highly more highly speculative and even just in some cases just wrong uh demonstrably but uh the uh and, and something like five or six of the papers by, were by eric davis but you know th these uh what, what I'm wondering is, okay, may, maybe a certain amount of money was spent on getting these reports written uh, by experts in the field, uh, many of them quite legitimate, uh, but there's nothing there. There's no there there. It's all stuff that you could get out of the open literature. You know what 
the impression I get, and I, I agree with you that I, I'm certainly not criticizing the the authors. I understand you're not either, but it should be understood that a great deal of it, if not all, is informed speculation and um, theory, as you were saying. An impression I get, though, aside from that, is when we get these leaks that aren't on letterhead, and we have these different threads that seem so far apart, like what does this, these papers that um, we can find uh, reason to believe Robert Bigelow at least encouraged them to write if, some of them, if not transferred money, and in some circumstances may have been paid. Don't know who they thought was paying them, not sure about that. But we have these papers on un, no letterhead. Then we have these stories of, yeah, ATIP, DOD was happening at, um, or DOD, if not ATIP, was happening at Skinwalker. And then we have these videos that um, were obtained by ATIP, part of the ATIP program, whatever that's supposed to mean exactly. And then when we see the actual calls for proposal of ATIP, we really can't see how this stuff fits in with it. And when we have all these different threads, it almost begins to take on the feeling that it was kind of a personal interest a couple of people might have had in it that worked at the DOD, the DIA, the Pentagon, and then may be kind of just lumping it all into this was our program. And that that that's the kind of thing I'm not really okay with when I'm wanting to get I, I can see these calls for proposals online. Well, then I want to see the funded ones and the project reports. I, I don't want to just see someone's um, notes that happen to be interested in UFOs if that's what we're starting to get a look at here. Hmm. Yeah, and, and so uh, I think we're in agreement. There's a lot of stuff missing uh, that could significantly increase the credibility of this whole story if it were produced. Yes, it, it certainly could. Or it might it might punch a hole in the balloon. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, especially when we're, we're starting to talk about some of the things that they've claimed were measured and uh, as we were talking about earlier, physiological changes in witnesses. Um, most any scientist, grant writer, anyone that's ever been involved at all in, in the research process would know that as long as they don't reveal what their objectives and methods and how it was measured were, that it's all just talk. And we can just debate their hearsay forever, but we can't really evaluate anything until they give us that information. And I confidently say, and they know that. And that does not bode well. That that's probably my number one concerning point there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I know you have a lot of experience in that area. So, uh, uh, the now, uh, given that this was a an earmarked funding though, uh, by Harry Reid for his friend Bigelow, it maybe that was all handled more or less as a rubber stamp. I don't know, but. Uh, the uh, I mean, as you point out, twenty-two million dollars may seem like a lot, but 
Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, it can it can be spent very very fast in the defense world. Uh, it takes some programs much more money than that just to get from concept to a broad plan. So mm -hmm. without without ever having built anything. Yeah, like it is an enormous amount of money when you just think about um, let's put together some projects to get an idea of trying to get under a glass what these things in the sky might be doing and what uh, the, the implications are and the threat is. It seems like an enormous amount of money, but I think you're the one experienced more than I that when you start talking about um, uh, teams of radar operators and research teams needed, no, I mean, $22 million is um, like the amount you, you spend to get a proposal done. You know, well, I mean, I have worked on proposals that have been in that order. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, now that usually involves a fair bit of technology development as well, but uh, you know, the uh, if you're if you have a small, lean, efficient team, you can get a lot done with twenty million dollars. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's. It, there are definitely, I mean, and if you have a very large group of people, that their burn rate's probably that much a month. So it it does vary all over the place. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, if you give me twenty million dollars to investigate UFOs, I get a lot done. <laughs> I promise. Right. I guarantee right. you, I will. Uh, yeah, I, that's what I mean. That it's like an enormous amount of money. If you know, you say, "Hey, Jack, you busy next month?" You know, that's a pretty good budget. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those but, right, idiots not, that actually spend but, it on doing what I said I would do. But uh, <laughs> right, but you you start modifying buildings in Las Vegas, twenty two million dollars doesn't go real far. You no, know, no, not, not at all. Uh, that's probably what they spent on just upgrading a ballroom, but <laughs> the uh, yeah, I I I have, I, and we don't know if if whether or not Bigelow put any of his own money into it or not, but uh, or that there may have been other sources of funding, but mm -hmm. and you know I think as taxpayers, unless there's some really good reason for not letting us know that, we get to, we should get to know that. Uh, but yeah, especially when, you know, they initially claimed it was not classified and for, you know, that was a comment I got from, from one person I was writing about it at the UFO trail was, um, that taxpayers deserve to know that their money is spent, not even how it's spent yet, but that it was spent. Like, let, let's address that first, that the project even exists, that it's not classified yet no one knew about it, and we can't get the documents on it. I don't, I'm not experienced enough at it to know what that even means. Like, how does that even happen? Well, you know? then, but then Harry Reid's, we have Harry Reid's memo where he says, oh, we have to set up a, a special group in Congress that are specially cleared to review the information. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Uh, bigoted access, I think he called it. Yeah, uh, which uh, that term doesn't, it doesn't mean what it obviously sounds like, but you know, right. it means right. it means basically some certain people are read in uh, to the program uh, within Congress who uh, have been read the Riot Act on re <laughs> on releasing yeah, that information. Yeah, right, right, right. Very discriminant <laughs> about who's read into it, right? And it it. I really, I don't know enough about it to be able to say, but it seems like they're tap dancing around some classifications like that. But I, I don't know enough about how money gets appropriated when it doesn't seem to be going 
through traditional channels or what we might call black funding. I, I don't know how senators just get to send somebody money and say, do this project. I don't know how that's done. Right. Uh, and that's on my list of things to understand better. Uh, um, the, uh, because uh, black projects are uh, one one of the potential sources of what some of my witnesses are seeing. So uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to know more about it. But uh, of course, we we can't know everything, but we can certainly know we can get some some insight into uh, how those get approved by Congress. Uh, Mm -hmm. without, without revealing the true nature of the project. So, uh, yeah. And you know, there's, there's been some criticism of those of us that want to see the beef that there, there's been some criticism of, you know, be happy that you're getting testimony that people like Elizondo are saying the things they're saying. And, I, I can relate to that to some extent, but we've just been jerked around so many times by so many people that the we we just to to be able to accept statements is true. We just have to wait till we know they're true. All right. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I mean, I I know in your book, uh, the Grays have been framed. You wrote quite a bit about. MK Ultra, and, and uh, I was just wondering if you uh, if you'd seen that uh, Netflix series uh, Wormwood. I have not. It's definitely on my to see list. I've heard a lot about it, so please go ahead. Well, I mean, it has to do with as you probably know the Frank Olson, uh, right? The death of Frank Olson, who was a uh, a bioweapons specialist at Fort Detrick, Maryland, uh, right. and uh, was possibly having uh, pangs of conscience over that and may have been considered a security threat. Uh, we, we, you know, we, none of that's really known for sure, but uh, the, uh, it set, somehow he got connected with MK Ultra and, and the, LSD experiments. I'm just wondering if, but since you haven't seen Wormwood, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll wait till you, till you have a chance to look at it. Uh, I mean, th that documentary pretty much pushes the notion that Frank Olson was murdered, right? Uh, right. Because he was considered a security threat, and uh, not that he was just an accidental casualty of of an LSD experiment. A good argument can be made. I think a lot of intelligence personnel at the time thought so. Whether they were right or not, I, I think a lot of members of the IC thought he was murdered as well. We can kind of ascertain from some of the documents. And some of the researchers that took up the gauntlet and tried to run it down over the years. An interesting thing about that to me was there's instances where they were contacted by people that tried to put them on the UFO angle of it, that it had something to do with um, somebody knew about UFOs or there was UFO information at Fort Detrick, so he was killed about that. And it, it seemed to me like more likely than that being true, it might be another instance of the, the old UFO crash meme rearing its head to take uh, researchers off into the weeds when they might have actually been heading towards another area of investigation that might have been relevant and significant. Yeah, you know, well, so. uh, there was... Uh, <laughs> The thing that might be significant was that, uh, you know, was, was the possible use of bioweapons against against North Korea in the, during the Korean War. Right, right. Yeah. And 
and and then uh, the the French town, yeah, the little French hamlet as well, Ponce Esprit, I think it was or that I'm probably butchering, but yeah, so right, and getting you know redirected, you know, like the coyote tries to do the road runner towards the you know UFO crash story was kind of an interesting angle as well that surfaces in there now and then yeah well i mean do you think that possibly uh, the whole bob lazar epic was was another one of those sort of deflection tech methods or it's sure possible uh an interesting thing to me about the the bob lazar type of circumstances where somebody claims they saw something while you know working in a secure facility kind of like do you recall the chase brandon episode the cia guy that worked in hollywood and before that he was undercover and he claimed that at one point he had um you know, as the stories go, they basically just happen upon a box of, you know. Oh, right, right, yeah. Yeah, the, the, here it is, you know, the the X-Files mother load in this box under somebody's desk or something. Or uh, and, Corso, who claimed to have all this yeah. stuff from UFOs. Uh, yeah, and so some... Never a shred of evidence for it, but... Yeah, yeah, so sometimes... And in, just a thought on that, that, you know, to throw it in with the rest of the theories, is maybe some of those people are telling the truth to some extent, and that in itself was an experiment to see what would happen if we show somebody some stuff. Will they tell? Who'll believe them? Who'll be interested in it? Um and, you know, then we kind of get in the, the James Carrion's area of research of let's track the people that show an inordinate amount of interest in the UFO story as a means that might be to try to find out what we're really doing in these facilities. And, you know, you get into a whole web of intelligence and counterintelligence games and uh, like the Simone Mendez story uh, that was in my book where she was given in all likelihood fake documents while she was um, holding a security clearance and working at the Area 51 base. And um, then that turned into a pretty traumatic investigation for her about, you know, where who she'd showed them to and that kind of thing that very well may have had some kind of uh, counterintelligence implications to it. So it, it's, and none of that necessarily means there's not something interesting about the UFO phenomenon, but it might also be true that it gets exploited and used as counterintelligence tools now and then. Yeah. So, I mean, we have to be really careful, right? <laughs> it's basically about any information that comes our way about UFOs. Uh, Pretty much, yeah. I mean, like... But we should be careful it, anyway about anything like that. <laughs> yeah, if we want to be accurate, we sure should. And, yeah, it does keep bringing us back to the point of you just have to make sure you got something verified before you... Um, are completely convinced in it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, to wrap this up, uh, where should we go from here? Do you think more FOIA requests are, are possible? Uh, are, are we hoping that TTSA will just come out with their information? Should we just wait? My idea at this point is I'm waiting to see what DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, will release to all of us that have requested the ATIP docs. Wait and see what they release and then build more FOIA requests off of that. But I'm never opposed to 
submitting more requests based on maybe some statements in Senator Reed's letters or whatever um, people can find that they can cite specific already authenticated documents and ask for more information about statements in those. What do you think? Where, where do we go with it from here? Well, uh, as you know, my little project has been to uh, try to contact some of the, uh, the, uh, the DIRD uh, authors. Uh, mm -hmm. So far, no luck with that. Um, but it's, it's August, and academics often are not <laughs> are out of town in August. So I'll, I'll wait a little longer. Uh, and I'll keep I'll keep trying that, uh, and but I think yeah I, I think essentially uh, people who really care about the truth and not just entertainment mm -hmm. should suspend judgment on everything that's come out so far until mm -hmm. it's met a standard of fact that it hasn't met yet. Mm -hmm. I agree. And uh, so I mean that's not easy. You'd you'd love to. You'd love to just go wholeheartedly in, in on it, or you'd love to, and some people would just love to totally dismiss it. I don't think you can do either one. Oh, I agree. I agree. Um, they're right. Like the the videos aren't being de debated that they exist or that some incidents have happened. What we want to see more about and i'm sure you'd agree is the specifics about the atip project and the physical evidence that's been claimed to be obtained and um, what the methods are with that and there's been a lot of contradictory statements about have they been tested have they not been tested do they even exist so i i agree completely there's uh it, it can't be completely pushed out of hand, nor can it be fully embraced. Yeah, so uh, I guess stay tuned. <laughs> right. Uh, well, uh, and I, I applaud the work that you and people like Keith Basterfield and John Greenwald have done and many others uh, to try to get at the truth. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll at least make some progress there. Uh, the, the, it may not be what people want to hear, but it, uh, I'm hoping that we'll clear things up eventually. Uh, so anyway, thanks a lot, Jack. Uh, what's, what's up with you now? Uh, are you writing another book? I haven't decided yet. I've, I've got a couple irons in the fire right now. The best way to keep up with me, I hope to see people over at my blog, The UFO Trail. It's ufotrail.blogspot.com or uh, touch base with me on Twitter at the UFO Trail. Yes, uh, and I do recommend that blog. And if you haven't read Jack's book, uh, The Grays Have Been Framed, Exploitation in, in, the, in the UFO Community, uh, you should read it. Uh, it's a, even if, you, even if you're a, a Hopkins uh Jacob's believer I think you should read it uh you, you may not agree with it but uh there's a lot there that needs to be looked at and also some of the shenanigans our own government's been up to so over the years and is still up to to some extent uh that and uh John Ronson's book uh the Ministerial goats are they're two good companion books uh, well, thank you. I'm honored. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Jack, and I hope we'll be in touch. Uh, and hopefully in a year or two we'll be able to get back together and reassess where we got, how we got to from there. Well, th thanks a lot. All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. Good night. Once again, thanks to Jack Brewer for joining us on API Conversation number 12. 
And I hope that you will check out Jack's blog, the UFO trail.blogspot.com, which uh, I'll have a link to in the show notes. You don't have to remember the URL. Our show notes will, of course, be at www.apicasefiles.com, or you can find them now, all our show notes now on aerial phenomenon.org, where you'll also find lots of other information, including all our investigations and a forum where you can report a UFO. If you want to report a UFO sighting, you can also just go to reportaufo.org and it'll take you right to that forum. You can contact us there. You can contact us on the blog entry for this conversation. This is conversation number 12, and it will be at both websites. We are transitioning from the Blogspot site to the WordPress site and we are no longer maintaining the old uh, apicasefiles.libsyn.com site. So you'll find the older episodes there, but no, no new ones. We hope you will take some time to check out our past episodes and conversations. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. You can also email Report a UFO at protonmail.com. If you have any interest, anything interesting you want to tell us, also UFO at aerial phenomenon.org. And we'll, we'll be happy to read your email and we'll respond and possibly even invite you to come on the API Case Files podcast and, and talk about your case or some interesting opinion that you have on the on the subject matter if you disagree with jack let's hear it okay that's it for conversation number 12 from api case files again www.apicasefiles.com api case files is released under the creative commons attribution share alike license music by dj spooky